Okay, welcome everybody. This is Betsy Hill, president of Brainware Learning, and I'm just so pleased to have everybody joining us for our webinar this morning or afternoon, depending on where you happen to be in the world. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things as we start. We are recording this session, and so if you need to leave or you're joining late or whatever it may happen to be, the recording will be available. Anybody who is registered will automatically get an email um, tomorrow with a link to the uh, recording. Um, if you would like to have a copy of the slides that we'll be using today, please just put a note in the chat window and we will be happy to email you a copy of the slides. And the last thing is I, um, the certificates of participation for today's webinar um, will be going out within a week. Uh, so stay tuned for that. If you don't see them this week, don't panic. It just means uh, we've had a lot of people attending and sometimes it takes us a few days to make sure we get um, those out to everybody who's attended who would like to have a certificate. Um, so with that, I think we can just go ahead and get started. So here's a cartoon that I found that I, I think reflects how we tend to think about teenagers and adolescents and the risk-taking behaviors that often accompany adolescent development. And maybe some of us can remember that exhilarating feeling of thinking we could do something and not really thinking about the consequences. Um, and today what we're going to do is look beyond those behaviors at the amazing developments that are going on in the adolescent brain and the science has uh, just been so fascinating in the last several years. So what I wanna do now is I want to have a little poll and I'm gonna launch this and it's gonna ask you a couple of things um, about some of the behaviors you associate with um, adolescents, mood swings, risk-taking, poor judgment, disorganization, et cetera. And then the second question, don't skip over that one, is would you like to go through adolescence again? So if everybody would take a moment and um, weigh in there, give us your thoughts. Let me give everybody a, another minute or so to think through and click on their choices for the answers to the questions. I think there are still some votes coming in, so we'll give everybody another few seconds. All right, Luci Luciana raised her hand. If you could put type your question, Luciana, into the chat window. We have two participants who raised their hands. Okay, so one of the things I forgot to do was to say, if you have questions along the way, please do type them into the chat windows so you don't forget them along the way. And we will get to as many of them as we can um, as we go through and at the end. So it looks like most of the people who have voted who have wanted to have voted. So I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results so that everybody can see them. So the number one answer to the behaviors that we associate often with adolescents are mood swings. Uh, number two, poor judgment. Number three, little emotional control, uh, risk-taking. And interestingly, not very many, but some votes for rapid learning and mature decision-making. And we're gonna talk more about that, those two in particular towards the end of the presentation today. So um, there are some somewhat surprising things, maybe not, uh, but I think they're pretty fascinating because those are, are traits or behaviors that we don't necessarily associate with adolescents. And, and maybe we need to rethink that a little bit. As to whether anybody would like to go through adolescence again, um, the answer is overwhelmingly no. 
I think we all, um, you know, the teenage angst and the changes and the, uh, uh, the, the difficulties that we often have at that, that time make it so that we don't necessarily want to go through it again and are glad to be on the other side. Um, I forgot to ask if anybody has teenagers currently because maybe you're going through it again, but in a slightly different way. So I'm gonna stop sharing results. And I think I can just close this. Hopefully that's all disappeared now. Um, so I wanna talk about what is adolescence. There's, there's really no um, absolutely firm um, definition other than it's that period of transition from childhood to adulthood. Um, it's not synonymous necessarily with puberty, although we often make that assumption. Um, and there are a lot of legal benchmarks sort of in the, these range of ages. Um, there actually is in most places, no legal age at which you have to be to, to babysit. Um, uh, most places you can hold employment at 14. Um, you may need parental uh, support to do that. Driving most places, at least in the US is 16. I believe it's older in some other countries in Europe. Um, getting married, voting, buying alcohol, and renting a car, which requires you to be 25. So why do the car rental companies add nine years to the legal age for driving for someone to rent a car? And undoubtedly, that's what their safety data tells them. And it happens to coincide with what the last couple of decades of brain research tell us, which is that the prefrontal cortex, so that part of our brain that's just behind our forehead and that's responsible for planning, decision-making and regulation of behavior and emotions are not fully developed until at least our mid twenties. So I don't think the car companies knew the neuroscience, but I'm sure they knew their data. And it's interesting uh, to me that, that those are uh, match up so very, very well. Um, and what the researchers are also telling us is that you can't really just explain adolescent uh, behavior as um, connected to hormones. Certainly hormones play a role, but there's an amazing amount of change that is actually going on in the adolescent brain that is really important um, and that sits underneath all of these uh, behaviors that you all noted. Um, the brain going through a, a process of reaching its maximum volume and then pruning away unused synapses, we'll talk more about that, how the prefrontal cortex is developing during this stage, the development of the cerebellum, significant changes in the brain's reward system, the dopamine system, changes in sleep patterns. And then uh, this is pretty much our agenda for today. And, and then we'll talk about some of those factors that uh, may modify or may um, exacerbate or to some, in some cases mitigate uh, some of the kinds of behaviors. So the adolescent brain is truly a work in progress. Um, those of you who have teenage and older children probably remember that day I remember it very vividly when I walked into my oldest son's uh, bedroom when he was 12 and a half and it smelled like a locker room. And um, all of a sudden in the middle of the night, somebody had gone in and taken my cute little boy and replaced him with some other creature. Um, but it is an amazing time. And this webinar is really all about all these changes that start to happen at about 10 to 12 and then continue through the teenage years. So our brains actually reach their greatest size or volume about the time of puberty in adolescence, about 11 years old for girls, a little bit later for boys. This has nothing to do with intelligence or anything else. It simply means when the brain is going through these processes. And what does, what does this mean for gray matter volume to peak? So remember that our brains, that is the gray matter in our brains uh, is made up of neurons, which are the brain cells that communicate with each other at those connections we call synapses. And so you can see a picture here of three 
uh, neurons. Each one has an axon. You can see those labeled on here. Um, and a bunch of dendrites. The axon is where the, um, nu the uh, neuron communicates. It sends an electrical signal down the axon um, to where it connects with a dendrite from another neuron at that synapse. It spills neurotransmitters, chemicals into that synapse, which is how they communicate. So it's partly electrical and partly a chemical signal. And that then the dendrite carries the information back to the other neuron. And we have billions and billions and billions of neurons in our brains with trillions and trillions and trillions of connections. So our brains are very, very busy places. And all of this, the neurons, um, axons, and dendrites are really um, what we're talking about when we, call, when we talk about gray matter. And what do neurons do when they connect? Well, that's what learning is all about. Learning is the making and strengthening of connections between thousands of neurons forming neural networks or maps. When we remember something that we have learned, we actually reconstruct or reactivate the network of neurons that were activated when we originally learned that thing or when we thought about it again. Um, and as the neuroscientists like to say, neurons that fire together, wire together. Wiring meaning not obviously physical wiring, but those strengthening those connections um, and those synapses so that when a neuron, a set of neurons and a network um, start to fire, then the others, those are activated, the others are more likely to fire it. And the more we activate then a neural network, the easier it is to reactivate it the next time to retrieve those memories. Um, for, more, for those of you who can remember what your teenagers were like uh, when they were babies, you probably recall that amazing rapid development of visual and motor skills, understanding and then producing language, understanding how the world works. And so these are images of brain tissue. The one on the left is a newborn, and you can see the neurons with the axons and a few dendrites and a few connections. Um, and then over on the right is the, um, the neural connections in a two-year-old. And you can see just this massive profusion of connections. Um, and this is really what learning likes, looks like. So when we talk about making and strengthening connections among neurons, this is really truly a picture of learning. And all this um, builds up these neurons until about the age of two, and then um, we, the brain goes through a process of pruning the unneeded neurons. So the brain can be um, a little chaotic uh, because it has really overproduced these connections in response to our experience, trying to figure out what the world is all alike and it tries different things. And then it starts to be able to figure out which are the most reliable, uh, which are the most useful, and it prunes away some of those other connections. And what we know now is that this is not the only time in our development that this buildup of neurons and subsequent pruning takes place. And you can probably guess just by the nature of this webinar what that second time is. And of course, it is an adolescence. So the adolescent brain is really, really busy creating new neural connections just prior to puberty. And this chart shows um, the difference between adolescents and young adults in various regions of the brain. Um, one of the things that um, you may find interesting is that cortical development, that it's the development of those outer layers of the brain that, that um, uh, in the different areas of the brain is asynchronous, that is different parts of the brain develop at different rates and at different times um, than um, others, which is true for humans um, and not true. Uh, cortical development is much more synchronous um, all over uh, at the same time with non-human primates. Um, so we get this burst of synapses and then we get a reduction in gray matter so that we get rid of those synapses that aren't very useful. And then we can look at the difference between adolescents and young adults and the, this is um, by using high resolution MRI. So it's actually looking at the structure of the brain 
and looking at lots and lots and lots of um, individuals. And you can see that the largest differences between um, adolescents and young adults are in the frontal lobe, which is a, at least twice the difference uh, as in other parts, other more mature parts that actually develop earlier in, in our brains. And interestingly, um, in the subcortical region. So subcortical is where our emotions are and where the systems and reward systems and things like that. And you can see that the difference there is just very, very large. Um, um, really like five times as much as uh, the difference in our frontal lobes. And it turns out that that difference and combined with the, the fact that our frontal lobes are still developing really helps us to understand a lot about the adolescent brain. So in addition to pruning away unneeded connections, so we experience the world, we build up this huge number of connections, we're gonna pare those down and get rid of the ones that aren't really useful. And then the other thing we're gonna do is gonna take those really useful ones and we're gonna uh, have them go through a process called myelination. And myelin is, um, white fatty substance. So if you've heard about white matter and gray matter in the brain, white matter is the myelin. And it's a, that substance that coats the axon, sort of like the insulation on an electric wire, which helps signals uh, transmit more efficiently. And in fact, once an axon becomes myelinated, it communicates a hundred times faster um, than it did before. And the resting period before it can fire again is 30 times. So essentially what this means is that faster and a shorter resting time results in neurons that are myelinated being able to communicate 3000 times more efficiently than before. So big change is happening. And as we said, Myelin, this process of maturation um, and particularly myelination does not occur um, all over the brain at the same time. And what you're seeing here are images of brain development in children and teens. You can see from the ages of five to 20, and you're seeing both sort of a slanted side version and then a top-down version to see the areas. So the parts that are red and yellow are the least well-developed. Um, those are the areas that are not yet myelinated. And you can see that that myelination process really happens from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. Um, and so, as you can see, when we have those parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, where we make those decisions and where we regulate our behavior, um, that are not completely developed yet, we can understand why they're not, if they're not as efficient. Uh, and particularly when we learn the next part about how active our reward system is, um, it's a recipe for, recipe for um, a good deal of exploration, risk-taking and um, other kinds of very fascinating behavior. So that's the story basically of the frontal lobes massive overproduction of synapses and pruning along with the myelination process that continues well into our 20s. Um, I hope you can see this cartoon. A mother and father are talking to their son and saying, young man, go to your room and stay there until your cerebral cortex matures. Um, and it turns out that this is actually not a model to follow. Um, and we'll explore that in a few minutes. Um, although many of us may have wished this at various times. Um, and the next story we wanna talk about just briefly is the cerebellum. So I'm gonna go back here. Let's we'll see if we can find a picture. I don't think I, yeah, I do. All right. So the cerebellum is this, it's called, means really the little brain and it's that part just above the brain stem below that you can see on the right here below the cortex in that um, image. Um, so it isn't finished either. And what you can see here is the, the change in the volume of the cerebellum, um, which really is peaking in those adolescent and teenage years. 
Um, and in fact, it's increasing in size more than the overall brain itself. And the cerebellum helps us coordinate voluntary movements. It also plays a major role in coordination and uh, balance. But it turns out that what we've learned recently is that there are more connections between parts of the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex than we have really appreciated. And those connections and the fact that neither the prefrontal cortex nor the cerebellum is fully developed suggests that this is a really important time for experiences that help develop higher cognitive functions and control. The next thing we wanna talk about is the massive change that occurs in a part of the brain underneath the cortex, and it's called the striatum. And um, it's in particular, a structure in the striatum that is called the nucleus accumbens. And um, it's in the sort of front part. Um, you can see the, the picture here uh, pointing to that. And it's, it's essentially the, the reward circuit of the brain. So when we do something that's rewarding in this, uh, the neurons that are in this area that project um, into the nucleus accumbens are activated and increase dopamine levels there. So dopamine again is that reward, feel good chemical. And what's extensive research is now showing is that the dopamine system in the brain is more sensitive. And in fact, it's really hyped up far more active during adolescence than it is in childhood or than, in, than for adults. And there's some um, fascinating research that's been done in the recent years. So this is from research conducted by Andriana Galvan at UCLA. She's a professor of psychology and behavioral neuroscience, and she studies adolescent brains and behavior. Um, she is, uh, her and her lab are quite wonderful. Um, I've heard her present and it's just always fascinating to listen to her. Um, and in this research study, what they wanted to do is to look at the response of the adolescent brain to rewards. And they started with something very basic that pretty much everything, everybody likes sugar. So they had a sugar water solution. Um, and what they did was they put teens and adults in an um, fMRI and in an MRI to, so they could scan it. And they, they first of all asked them how much they liked the sugar water and everybody liked it. Of course, pretty much we all like sugar, but as you can see, the teens rating was much higher, significantly higher than the rating for adults. So they said, mm, this is really great stuff. And then while they were in the MRI, so uh, functional MRI, so that they could look at where the brain is most active while the teens and the adults were sipping that yummy sugar water. And you can see these yellow spots are where the brain is most active. And again, this is the area called the striatum. So the neurons in this area, while um, these individual participants in the study, while they were sipping their sugar water, um, the neurons in this area are busy increasing the amount of dopamine in the brain. And the pattern of activation, so the area in which it was, the brain was active, was the same for teens and adults. However, the level of activation was much higher in the teenage group than the adult group. So it's really not just that our prefrontal cortex is not regulating responses to things that we, that we like, but maybe we should have second thoughts about. It's the areas of the brain that process rewards are more active. And so we are far more sensitive as teenagers to those reward systems. Um, also interestingly, the teenage group was the only one only group where there was a correlation between how they rated their likings of the sugar water and the level of activation in the brain. So the adult ratings did not correlate as well. Um, they had activation in the same area, but it wasn't sort of that, um, that strong correlation between their ratings and how their brain was actually uh, behaving in the MRI. Then they repeated the experiment with something else that people pretty much like, and that was money. Um, and this time they looked at the brain activation for kids, for teenagers, and for adults. 
And you can see that there's not a lot of difference between the kids and the adults. I mean, everybody likes uh, money and the part of the brain that was activated was the same for all of them. But you can see that there's that big spike, far more response in the teenage brains to this reward, much greater than for kids or for adults. And um, Galvan explains that, you know, you might explain that teenagers are more find money more rewarding because they have less of it. But then you would expect an even greater response for the kids because arguably they typically have even less than teenagers. So um, it's not it's not that it's really about the brain's activation and response um, at this time when the prefrontal cortex really has not come online yet. So they're not getting that oversight, if you will, from that part of the brain to, um, to um, regulate the response. So adolescents are hypersensitive to incentives, to rewards, um, and it's also been shown that activity in this part of the brain is associated with risky behavior. Um, but it's not just about seeking rewards. Dopamine is, which is the neurotransmitter that we've been talking about, is highly involved in learning. So we wanna explore that a little bit more. When you're confronted with a situation that is uncertain, that is where you don't know exactly what is gonna happen, um, in fact, what you're going to do is do something so that you can learn what is going to happen. Um, and if the situation is uncertain, that is what actually prompts the release of more dopamine than if the situation is certain, even if the outcome is positive. So sometimes we think about it's just when something positive happens, we get this. It's actually the process and the experience of uncertainty that um, generates this, uh, the release of, of the dopamine. Um, so for example, if I tell you that you have a 100% chance of winning a new car or a 0% chance of winning a new car, um, there's very little activation in the reward center of your brain. It looks pretty similar, even though in one case, I'm telling you, you, you want it. In another case, I'm telling you, you're definitely not winning it. But if, you, if I tell you you have a 50% chance of winning, then dopamine is released and the level of act, activation is sustained. So dopamine is really about optimizing learning. So here's another um, experiment that, um, and we can actually try this ourselves. Um, so I want you to think about this. In this experiment, participants got to choose their reward and they could choose the left side where there was $2 under the cup and they were told there's $2 under the cup. So they would be sure of getting those $2 if they choose the left side, or they can choose the right side where they can select one of the two cups and there's $4 under one cup and nothing under the other. So the expected payout, if you did this over and over and over again, of course, is the same $2 on the left and $2 on the right. But in this case, you just get one, you only get one time to choose. You have to choose once. Um, so I want to ask everybody to think about which side you would choose. And maybe you want to go ahead and just type a little response in the chat window. And let's see if people are going to choose the left side or the right side. The sure thing. Oh, do we have some problems, I guess, with the poll earlier? The left side, the left side, the certain two dollars. Oh, Kathy, I'm gonna have to talk to you about your risk taking here. Oh, we have some others on the right side too. Okay, we've got quite a mix here. So when the context was receiving the possible reward, early and mid adolescents choose the right side much more frequently than younger children or young adults. And when they're doing that, brain scans also show more activation in that subcortical and the striatum um, in, uh, for them than for other groups. So clearly at the same time that adolescents' frontal lobes are maturing, they're actually more responsive to emotions and to risks. 
But I want to go back to that concept of dopamine as a learning chemical. Um, the affinity for uncertainty in the adolescent brain actually serves a very important purpose, and that is learning. So this was research again um, conducted in um, Adriana Galvan's lab at UCLA. And here um, the adults and teens had to learn which flower the butterfly preferred. And so they would click on the one on the left or the one on the right, and they would get feedback. And every time they got feedback, they could adjust and would keep clicking. And over time, um, they would learn which flower the butterfly preferred. And as you would expect, when the teens got it right, there was more activation in the striatum than for adults. And what we might not have anticipated is they learned the task more quickly and with greater accuracy than the adults. So why would that make sense from an evolutionary point of view? Adolescence is a time of intense learning on the way to greater independence. And emotions helped us to connect and to create stronger memories. And so because of that activation, when you think about dopamine as a learning chemical, it actually facilitates more quicker, more accurate, and more intense learning. So adolescents are great learners. Now there's one more um, area we wanna talk about um, in terms of some of these amazing changes. Um, if we're not overwhelmed already by all those changes, I'm sort of exhausted. And I think back to my adolescent self and wonder um, how we all got, got through that all. But um, we do know also that teens start to sleep less after puberty and their biological clocks shift um, in that process so that they um, go to sleep later and um, would like to sleep in later. Um, and we haven't altogether adapted to that as a society, but uh, we might want to pay some attention to that. Sleep, of course, has a tremendous impact on attention and cognitive performance and sleep deficits, even um, fairly uh, minor ones can actually have a pretty significant impact on cognitive performance. Sleep is also essential for memory. It's during sleep that we encode long-term memory we um, sleep is what allows us to sustain our learning, protecting it against new learning so that we don't sort of overwrite uh, the, what we've just learned, um, uh, protecting against interference so that we don't just uh, replace uh, an old memory with a new one. We want to connect it. And then we actually create additional connections uh, while we're sleeping. So, um, uh, as well as being able to often solve problems more quickly and more efficiently, more accurately, more effectively um, after we've had some sleep. So sleep is a really important thing for, for many reasons. Um, and those are certainly when it comes to learning some of the most important. So um, some more, some interesting research, and again, this is Adriana Galvan, who is the sort of the one of the leading people looking at the teenage brain and the adolescent brain. So what they did um, is they they had uh, adolescents, teenagers, come into the lab, and they um, gave them. Uh, asked them about to report on the sleep quality and um, various aspects of um, their sleeping situation. They also had them uh, wear an actigraph, which is like a wristwatch, but it, what it does is it evaluates and measures the quality of sleep. And they also did fMRI images of their developing brains. And what they learned from this, there were some things that they had anticipated, but they had some things that were not necessarily what they had anticipated. So one of the things that they did anticipate was the teens who had better sleep had stronger connections in the areas of the brain that regulate behavior and emotions. So when it comes to brain development, sleep seems to be, again, a very, very important thing. And if we want our children to grow up and to develop those strong connections in the prefrontal cortex and from the prefrontal cortex to the 
subcortical areas of the brain, um, sleep seems like it's a very important thing. Then they looked at what seemed to be the reasons for better sleep. And uh, we might again have everybody um, just type into the chat window, why do you think that some teens had better sleep than others? What do you think might account for better sleep or less good sleep? I'm gonna peek into the chat window. Technology, social media use. That was what that one of the things that they definitely expected that you know on their Facebook, Snapchat, whatever, until all hours of the morning might account for it. Drama with friends, okay. Tech continuously eating habits, exercise habits. Well, here is <laughs> here is something that they found, which surprised me, surprised them. Teens who reported more comfortable bedding were the ones with stronger connections in the brain. So it's sort of, it's really fascinating because it, this is something that might be fairly accessible in terms of making small changes. Um, this isn't to say that there's no effect of staying up late and shortened sleep cycles and things like that. That is true. Um, but in, in this experiment, as they looked at it compared to other kinds of behaviors, um, it, more important than um, noise and light uh, where they slept. Uh, so it's just really, I think, interesting food for thought and something we might want to uh, pay attention to. And maybe those teens who are couch surfing um, aren't getting the best sleep. And maybe, maybe it's a little bit chicken and egg making the choice to sleep on a couch. Uh, if they have other choices might not be uh, the best, but um, I think help to, helping teens understand that this is a, a factor might be an important one. So as we try to pull all of this together, we see the real paradox of um, adolescence. Teens have really good um, cognitive skills and they can perform them in, in the lab just as well as, as adults can. But in real life, decisions include all kinds of factors that raise the emotional stakes. And so when we raise the emotional stakes and we have uh, these kids who are with hyped up reward systems where emotions are even stronger than normal. And some of the kinds of things, peers, stress, lack of sleep, um, really can lead to um, issues with judgment, self-inhibition, impulse control. Those are not really gonna be operational. And while they can make these logical decisions when they, in the presence of peers or when they're under stress or when they have significant lack of sleep, then you're gonna see that lower response inhibition. Um, there are lots of experiments that show this, although I don't know that this will surprise any of us who have been or raised teenagers. Um, but it's really interesting to sort of see that how this plays out. And one of the areas that this has, uh, we see this is in emotion recognition. So again, if everybody could sort of type into the chat window what emotion this person is experiencing, let's see what everybody has to say about this. Shock, one says. Fear, fear, dread, shock, fear, okay. All right, we're getting a pretty consistent response, which is what happens actually in the lab when they do experiments. And in this experiment, the um, definitely saw this uh, uh, playing out where adults consistently, let me hang it one second, uh, consistently identify this as fear, but Teenagers overwhelmingly identify this as um, anger. And in fact, teens generally over identify just about everything um, as anger. So if you think about when you, um, you know, are come into the room and maybe um, 
encounter your uh, student who's a teenager or your child who's a teenager. Um, and maybe you have a look of just interest or concern or um, contemplativeness or, you know, a whole variety of different kinds of emotions that you could identify and that we could identify in other faces as adults. But teens overwhelmingly identify them as, as um, anger. And so they think that people are, and remember, they're responding emotionally. And so you're very likely to get that response of, what, I didn't do anything. You know, that's their defensive uh, response to um, having that experience of, of perceiving somebody as, as being anger. So what we wanna do now is, is to um, really sort of focus on peers, curiosity, life stressors, some of those other things that are going to um, contribute to that behavior. And um, this, is a, this is obviously, we're looking at, at peer influence here. And here's an experiment that was done um, with, um, I'm missing the reference here. So I'm gonna to have to um, add that to the slide when I send it. But basically what the experiment involved is that um, as the participant, you come in and you are looking at this virtual shelving and you can see the, what's in these various um, cubicles. Um, and then what they do is introduce the person they call the director who is looking at this object from the other side. And you can see that there's a gray um, air thing blocking the, um, that person's vision. So the, the director can't see some of these things. So if um, the director said to us, okay, move the top truck left, Okay, so the top truck from our point of view is the white one. But remember, the director can't see that. And so the top one from his perspective is the blue one. And what they found was that um, for, so this is what it looks like. So you can see both views and how the, the blue one would be the one that the director was referring to. And when he says, move the top truck left, in this experiment, what happened was um, that um, adults and adolescents performed fairly similarly and um, uh, got them wrong at about the same rate. But then they um, um, give, did the same experiment, but what they did is rather than having the director be the one they just said, okay, here's just a, a rule. So forget there's a director, we don't have to worry about that. Um, so this is purely a cognitive task without anybody else uh, being a factor in it. And when they, so when they got it without the director, it was just a rule, ignore the objects in a gray background, then um, things changed. And here's what happened. So for in the no director um, condition, you can see that um, adults performed very, very well. So very few mistakes, um, but when they were in the presence of another person. So adults even are affected by this uh, peer watching them kind of um, uh, situation. And so what you see is if you look across age groups, you see a, a overall decline in the number of errors and the percentage of errors in the no director um, or in the director situation. So we get better at controlling our um, task performance in the presence of others as we get older. And we see for up through the mid-teen years, um, an improvement in the no director so that cold cognition situation. And so it turns out that um, teens from the, their mid-teens um, are just as good at decision-making and carrying tasks out and being accurate as adults when they're not in the presence of peers, but make far more mistakes um, when they are in the presence of, of their peers. Um, 
And when it, you know, whether you move the correct truck or not um, may not be a terribly risky behavior. But of course, when we see it in a behavior that could be particularly risky, there's even more important differences. Um, so this is research from the lab of uh, Dr. Larry Steinberg at Temple University. And what this involves is lying in an MRI and playing a game called the stoplight game. And basically you get a series of stoplights and you, you're always getting to it when it's about to turn orange and the time varies a bit, but you have to decide uh, whether to stop or not at each of these stoplights. And first you do the task by yourself. And then the next time through, you are told that your friends will be watching you even though they don't actually watch. So it turns out they don't, they don't watch, you don't know that, you just think they are. And so teens and adults perform this task the same when they're doing it alone. And adults perform the task the same alone and when they are told that their peers are watching. But teens crash much more often in this simulation and have much higher activation of the striatum when they believe their peers. So that peer presence creates even more activation in that hypersensitive uh, dopamine reward system. It also turns out that both younger and middle adolescents are more sensitive to social exclusion. So not just the presence of peers, but um, very high sensitive to so social exclusion has a big impact on ratings of mood. And we all do, of course, uh, to some degree, you can see that even in adults where um, the exclusion situation, the mood ratings were, were lower, um, but it's much more significant, of course, for younger uh, children. So the statistics, of course, are pretty um, uh, remarkable, um, certainly noteworthy. And you can see here for females and for males, the difference between those in, early ad, in the early adolescence, early teen years, uh, with those in the later teen years, um, and the causes of death that um, are the most important um, at those different areas. And um, some really significant um, increases. So road injury, interpersonal violence, self-harm, drowning, things that occur at much higher incidence for, for boys, um, maternal complications, self-harm, road injury, and um, you know, the directly the result of risk-taking kinds of behaviors. I wanna talk a little also about substance abuse in the adolescent brain. Um, these are some statistics that um, are, um, talk about the, the, the impact and the high incidence. Although you also have to remember that for, you know, if you say that regular alcohol use increases from 17% to 45%, there's still 55% who are not using it regularly. Um, drug use, you know, you still got the largest, but there are some teens who are gonna be uh, more vulnerable and uh, for much greater concern than, um, than others. 80% um, of kids have had a drink in the last 30 days by 12th grade. And um, many, a large portion of youth meet a diagnostic criterion for substance abuse. Um, so this is all actually true both for boys and for girls um, in those early years. So it's really a period of heightened vulnerability, um, not just because they're the choice and the lack of um, cognitive regulation to, um, to the temptation to do these things, but um, there is some evidence that there is an impact on brain development from using um, these substances during those, that period when the brain is developing so fast, those changes are happening so fast. So alcohol abuse um, is associated with smaller volumes in the, structure of the brain called the hippocampus, which is essential for learning, for producing long-term memory. Um, 
marijuana has been associated with different ratios of white to gray matter, so less myelination. So slowing down that process, that important process of myelination, myelination and making the brain more efficient. Um, prefrontal cortex volumes, um, lower in adolescent heavy drinkers, and some evidence in girls at least of um, some delays in synaptic pruning from marijuana use. And both seem to affect white matter, so myelination in, in various parts of the brain. So we really need to be aware of and to think about the fact that these are um, periods of time where it's not just, oh, they're almost adults. Um, these, because of this dramatic and um, intense time of change in the brain, there is additional vulnerability. Um, as many of you probably know, just say no doesn't work. Um, what I have here is a resource and you'll get the slides. Anybody who wants them, once again, just put a note in the chat window if you haven't already that you'd like a copy of the slides. And there are some um, great resources here on um, for educators and for parents um, on helping uh, teens in this area. So I wanted to share a couple of views of adolescence. And, and one is um, Shakespeare, who wrote in The Winter's Tale, I would there were no age between 10 and three and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest. For there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancientry, stealing, fighting. So that's that view of adolescence as a time of mood swings, risky behavior, lack of emotional control, all those sort of typical kinds of behaviors that we see. And certainly those are possible and those are present and we can't ignore that. Now we understand a little bit more about what that, what's causing that. But I wanna give you another view. So I sort of took the liberty of rewriting Shakespeare a little bit here. And here's my view. I would that all between 10 and three and 20 would sleep enough and well, for there is no better time than in the between for learning, detaching from the ancient tree, strengthening the prefrontal cortex, finding their passion. So this is truly an amazing time because it is, there's so much learning going on and there's so much um, potential. The fact that they can think extremely logically um, in the right kinds of situations and the fact that they, this, this incredible time of, of learning and, and having our brains become more efficient. So just to share a couple of other things, um, Daphna Shahami at Columbia University talks about that teen brains are making powerful connections that help them learn from their experiences. So they need to have those experiences. They need to make those powerful connections. This is what sets them up for independence and for um, the kinds of learning that will take them into adulthood. And from Adriana Galvan, rather than asking how you can keep your teenager from taking risks, it's better to ask, how do I provide opportunities for healthy risk-taking? So just think about that for a moment. Those Trying to prevent risk taking is, it's, that's not, first of all, it doesn't work. And second of all, it's not good because they have to be able to take those risks as part of the learning process. So, how do we give them, you know, things like um, uh, signing up to be in, a, in the school play, even if you've not acted before, um, engaging in sports doing things that maybe help them step outside, maybe having them explore different career opportunities and, um, and taking on work when they are old enough and ready enough. All of those kinds of things help them take risks in a, a much healthier way. So as we wrap up, I just want to um, sort of restate what we've been talking about. So from a behavioral or, or psychological perspective, um, and from the point of view of a parent who's, uh, whose children are now in their mid to late 30s. Uh, so those prefrontal cortexes seem to be working quite well. 
Um, but we've seen teens making enormous gains in learning, logical thinking, abstractions, the ability to make decisions. But while some decisions are good, there's a strong tendency to more impulsive behaviors, um, particularly um, in when we have peers around us. And we saw that this dichotomy is developmental, can really be understood by changes in the frontal lobes, our prefrontal cortex, the cerebellum, the reward system, sleep patterns, and in the interactions of all these other factors, including peers and stress. Um, so to paraphrase Crosby, Stills and Nash, teach your, teach your children well about their brains. And I think that is um, something that is an important implication of what we've been talking about, sharing the research on adolescents with certainly educators, parents, and others, but also with teens themselves. I think when we understand about the changes that are occurring and, and uh, the role of different um, aspects in our brain and the enormous changes and how much um, opportunity this brings them, um, it's an important understanding for uh, children in that age range. Modeling rational decision-making and emotional control don't react in kind um, because then they are not seeing the model of a more mature prefrontal cortex. Sometimes they can really get our goats, but if we can use our more well-developed prefrontal cortices, cortex, um, you can explain your thinking, you know, I oh, I just really felt like doing, really feel like going and sitting, you know, going to the pool um, or taking a walk on the beach um, or um, just sitting and playing on, on my computer for a while. But I knew I had this important thing to do and I decided to do why. So pointing out that there, there is a decision process and that you can weigh them. Um, giving teens practice and in making independent decisions, thinking through and then reflecting on the consequences. Um, if you've ever seen a teen who did something really boneheaded um, and you ask them why they did it, very often they'll say, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. So it seemed like, it felt like it, it was a good idea at the time because they did not think through the consequences. Giving them opportunities for healthy risk-taking and helping them find their passions. These are the areas where they can really start to leverage that immense learning capability that their brains have at this age to learn about the things that they will ultimately really care about and be involved in. So um, I want to stop there and um, open up the floor for questions. I, I hope um, people have been putting them into the chat window and if not, I hope they will do so now. Betsy? Yep. Maria had a question early on. Um, are students learning about their brains in school? In my experience, um, the word brain doesn't come up very often in schools. Um, we certainly work with schools, um, the schools that we work with, we are often involved in helping teachers educate um, students about their brains. Um, I was thinking of um, an, an educator who's the um, behavioral counselor. So she's in charge of uh, uh, um, the RTI aspects of behavior in a school in Indianapolis, Indiana. And um, she was using Brainware Safari, the cognitive training software with her students. And as she did it, she created a whole bunch of posters and information so that students could understand what was happening in their brains, which part of their brains they were developing, how our brains get stronger. She put some, um, you know, some tape around the door and put up a big sign that said brains in development. You know, when kids understand that, I think they take, uh, they have a sort of different uh, perspective, a little bit different experience on everything they can go through in school. Um, very young children, um, I have a, a colleague who was the um, principal of Catholic school in Florida, 
who taught kindergartners about brains, about the, their connections. You can start with basic lessons about the senses and how information gets from our senses into our brains. Um, kids love learning about their brains. This isn't something you have to twist their arms to do. Um, and it can be powerful really at, from very young kids up through, well, I don't know, I'm pretty interested in the brain. So I haven't stopped being a kid in that respect. Any other questions? Favorite books about brain development? Um, so um, Norman Deutsch um, I th is, wrote a book called um, The Brain That Changes Itself. I think that's what it's called. That's a wonderful book. Um, John Medina, Brain Rules. Um, for any educators, if you have not read Pat Wolf's Brain Matters, um, you th that's my primary go-to book on the brain, how it works and how it develops and what those implications are for educators. Um, here, let me mention a couple of other things too, because these are really useful for, um, for kids themselves. There's a wonderful book called Your Fantastic Elastic Brain. Um, parents or teachers can use this. It's a wonderful book for young children um, that talks about the brain, how it works and how it develops. Um, and there's an, a version for uh, teenagers called A Driver's Manual for Operating Your Adolescent Brain. I think I've got those pretty much correct, but Joanne Deek is the author of both of those. And that's Joanne, J-O-A-N-N. D-E-A-K. And I think I will less restrain I'm just talking about normal doing real. I Carrie, that's a great question. I don't know of any. Um, but I'm going to start exploring that. It's a great question. Any other questions anybody has? If we're past our past our stopping point by a couple minutes, but if you could certainly take another um, copy of the slides, great. Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. It's um, I love doing these because I learn as much as uh, I share, <laughs> and it gives me an opportunity to update my own understanding and to get new questions, as you just saw that. Uh, that I want to explore. So again, thanks so much for being here. Um, if anybody would like to continue the conversation in other contexts, here's my contact information. And um, we look forward to um, future opportunities to, to talk with you and share with you. Hope everybody has a great day, great rest of your week. And um, we'll hopefully see you at another neuroscience and education webinar sometime soon. I wanted to pop back in and just say, hooray for Deborah Connolly. She's going to use the info for teen tree huggers. I love it. I wish them my best. And uh, I, I love all those teen tree huggers and others. <laughs>